Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we have a guest lecture by Professor Santosh Narona, he is a faculty at IIT Bombay who works in the areas of big data analysis and various device development. Today's lecture is about data analysis in evaluating the various hypotheses like searching for a potential drug delivery target or a genetic target in a disease context where we are trying to search for a biomarker candidate or a potential drug candidate, it becomes very crucial to know how to make a good experimental design, in which manner our data should be reproducible. If you think about a test which is has to be given to the patient, the test has to be reliable, reproducible as well as it has to serve the large community. So, therefore, your number of patients to be included for the study has to be much larger. Your study design has to think about various flaws, various mistakes, various errors which might be happening if you do not carefully consider your end goals, your actual questions to address. So, in this light, Professor Narona is going to illuminate your understanding about how one should think about the good experimental design before actually planning and executing the OBEX experiments. By now you are familiar that data generation using protein microarrays or using various type of NGS platforms or various type of proteomic technologies are quite straightforward as long as your sample preparation is good, as long as you know what exactly biological question you want to ask for. However, to really get a meaningful data, meaningful information is not so straightforward and that is where you need people who have good knowledge for statistics who can work with you in designing good experimental plan. So, if the aim is to look for biomarkers or to choose the drug target, your experimental design, your study plan, your number of patients, replicates, all of these things becomes very crucial. So, let us welcome Professor Narona to give you this lecture about how to really carefully plan a good experimental design for omic based studies. From what I see as a background of most of the participants here, your students that too from a life sciences background, most of you, there are some researchers here as well I understand. So, I thought it would be very useful and provocative both to bring up a discussion of data analysis as it applies to multivariate experiments such as the ones you are doing in proteomics. So, a big issue with statistics is how confident are you about any insight you get out of any analysis that you do and while clearly you are spending 3 to 4 days learning about experimental protocols. The question is what are you going to do with this data that you generate and what hypothesis does it drive and for that matter how valuable is this data that you are generating in the first place. So, I am not actually going to take a case study and the reason I am not taking any case study is because I am not in this domain as a core domain. I am a biochemical engineer, I am interested in production of pharmaceuticals. I usually do not ask questions about what is the role of this gene in that particular disease context and so on. But one of the things as an engineer you are forced to do is to deal with large amounts of data, especially in a process analysis context and this data analytics kind of need actually we find is very useful in evaluating hypothesis, which is what most scientists are concerned with. So, these are a collection of thoughts that I have had over a while, which I think apply mostly to scientists, less so to engineers. But they have to do with the fact that we are generating data at very large scales, we are generating data in very large amounts and the question therefore is given this rate at which we are generating data and the assumption by the way is that experiments we are doing 
are well-designed experiments which are therefore generating good data. But given this data, the question is what can you infer and what are potential errors that one can make in trying to arrive at conclusions? So that's why I'm titling this particular talk as one on reproducibility in particular. And one flip side to this is as we see a lot of publications come out, especially in omixed domains, the question comes up which aspects of these are reproducible and if they're not reproducible, what kinds of mistakes are people making which prevents good insights from okay, potentially being leveraged into some kind of future drug development pipeline. So remember most of the reasons for working in the space of omics is that you're trying to find targets typically for drug delivery. Okay, so at every level here you can be asking the question, have I statistically found a good target? Second, given a target, have I statistically found a good drug candidate given that there's a library of a zillion candidates? Have you found a good candidate to deploy okay, as a potential drug? And if you think about what's actually occurred out there, the success rates are very low. And success rates invariably are low because of issues to do with reproducibility and that's what I want to deal with. If you look broadly at um, why most published findings are false, you can break it down into different possibilities, which is that you've actually thought of a good research design for your experiment. But given the fact that, for example, if you're talking about disease conditions, given the fact that you might not be able to access that particular tissue type in more than one patient, therefore, you're not in a position to do replicates of this as a study systematically over a larger population, you might therefore end up with sheer bad luck and with an incorrect result. It's kind of like saying you'll toss a coin 100 times and with your bad luck, the one time you tossed a coin 100 times, you might have ended up with 30 heads out of 100, which is theoretically possible. And 30 out of 100 sounds as if you have a biased coin, not a fair coin, okay? Nothing wrong with getting 30 out of 100. It's just that it's a random event. It has to do with the fact that coin tosses are random events. And with your sheer bad luck, the one time you did it, you could have ended up with 30. Now your problem is you're trying to ask the question, why is this coin okay, behaving in this particular fashion? You would have expected a fair coin, therefore you would have expected 50 heads out of 100. And instead when you see a 30, you're actually pushed into this question as to whether what you're seeing is an example of an unlucky event with a, with a fair coin, where you should have expected 50 heads, but instead you saw 30. Or have you instead seen a biased coin? So which way is this? So in, in other words, are you looking for a particular hypothesis and you're saying that that hypothesis is not true? Or are you saying that an alternate hypothesis is true? Which way do we go? So this is a situation in which instead of that fair coin now and, and biased coin, think of whether you're looking at a genetic target for manipulation in a disease context. So is that target something that you've pulled out as a random event or is it so significant to you that you feel that you should now go do follow-up experiments? The context of this is therefore that if you're trying to find targets and there's an investment, by the way, in both the experiment that you've performed to find targets and an investment subsequently in trying to validate these targets, okay, how confident are you in carrying out these experiments? And of course, the assumption in all of this that the experiment is designed correctly, that you've done it with appropriate controls, that you have randomized, that you've got appropriate uh, okay, uh, controlled experiments that you're doing. And if you have not done that, then things are only going to get worse in terms of the quality of data that you have. And even more critically, and this is a sad fact, if you as an investigator are already biased towards one cluster of genes as being important to you, then personal bias makes things even worse. And the brute truth of this is that most published results are therefore irreproducible. So much so, if you go to the journal Nature, there's an entire subdomain on that website which talks about irreproducible research. And their concern is, for all those papers trying to get published in nature, how do you guarantee that whatever insights or whatever results that somebody is trying to package in that paper, how confident are you that those are reproducible enough that they're worthy of being published and being published not just in any journal, but in nature? So they're so concerned that there's a subsite that they've created on reproducibility and the lack of it. There are several causes for why there's this bias ultimately, and I'm just, I'm gonna list a few as we go along. And not all of these have to do with omics, but I want you to appreciate the broad idea. And finally, towards the end, we'll talk about how to control for some of these. But the most important reason for why results are not reproducible is something called a confirmation bias, which is you already have a hypothesis going in your mind 
about what you think is the underlying cause for this disease. And now when you're generating data, you're only paying attention to those data points or that subset of data, which you think confirms your hypothesis. Okay? And in doing so, because you're only looking at a subset of data points, you're probably missing out something more important, which might have told you something else about the disease condition. Okay? The other reason is very common, which is that people manipulate the uh, analysis outright. And a third situation is that the results are not independently tested. You may have already had some discussion about this in terms of your omics uh, pipelines. But a typical uh, headache, for example, is that tissue sample, which you're processing for an omics study, is not available to a different researcher. So there's no way of validating whether your actual experimental workflow was executed correctly or not. Therefore, whether your targets are therefore relevant or not. So let's look at um, uh, these one by one. So the oldest example of confirmation bias is actually somebody you'd be surprised with, Gregor Mendel. To give you an idea of why, you know, if Gregor Mendel were to publish in this day and age, in fact, he would not publish. He would not be published because you would say that he cheated. He plagiarized his data. Why? You sit and do that pea plant experiment, which he is famous for, where he has expected to get a proportion of threes to one daughters with a certain phenotype. You do that experiment starting with pea plants. Your proportion of plants, of daughter plants, which, have, which are carrying a particular phenotype, will not turn out to be 25%. 25% to give uh, Gregor Mendel credit was something which he realized intuitively was some number to round off to. That the threes to one proportion is probably a nice rounding off of numbers. But if you sat and did the raw experiment yourself and you collected a whole bunch of plants and you categorized them by the lengths of the leaves and so on, you would not get 25% of, of them having short leaves versus long leaves, for example. What does that tell you? It tells you that he was already biased towards reporting a result of three is to one. He wanted a number three is to one. Of course, there was no statistician there at that time to challenge him. Of course, these days there are when you send out an article for a review process. So when he says three is to one, a whole bunch of people accept three is to one as if it's the truth. But here's the thing, that experiment could never have been reproduced. Okay? And he goes into this with a specific bias. And the irony is the law of inheritance as he found it is an accurate description of how inheritance happens. But inherently you have a problem that this is not inheritable. The second um, reason why uh, most results are not reproducible is that there is manipulation of this data. And especially in um, large departments in the West, you're starting to see a paradigm where there is sponsorship of the research in the department by some large entity, a pharmaceutical company, and that starts influencing okay, the whole process of which types of hypotheses will you look at, what data will you generate, what kinds of experiments will you actually perform and report, and you're not free, therefore, to actually carry out certain types of experiments because you're using the pharma company's money. You're not free to do what you want to do. And therefore, you're not truly reporting what you think is a, is a relevant insight. Okay? So this is an example where manipulation happens. And this, uh, uh, a spin-off of this is at, at any given point in time, one particular type of investigation suddenly becomes hot. And everyone tries to do that. And that's accepted as a standard protocol for data generation. But there's nobody challenging. Okay, because there's nobody capable of challenging, given that it's not a kind of facility that's available to you everywhere, okay, what, what the truth is of, of that uh, particular data set or whether there's some prejudice involved in analysis. And this is a simple example to point out what happens if you manipulate data outright by misreporting, on, in this case, not reporting data. So if you look at uh, the plot on the right and you look at the reported R square value, it's a simple straight line fit which I'm reporting here, you'll swear that it's a great line. That R square value, if you just go by a published R square value, you'd think it's a good model. But you see how you've arrived at a good model by just omitting a few data points and the risk associated with selective okay, reporting of data in a publication. And a final point on this line is that when you're talking about uh, testing and independent testing, the fact remains that we are all working in isolation and therefore there is no culture of materials being shared and being retested elsewhere. If you're saying that something's a critical um, uh, hypothesis, a critical gene, for example, or a critical protein in some kind of a disease condition, the first thing you ought to do is for this protocol to be repeated by somebody else, by a different investigator who ideally doesn't have access to your raw materials and therefore is independently validating that your idea can be reproduced elsewhere. Okay. All of this comes down to how you set up 
for the most part in especially an omics type of approach a hypothesis. The entire statistical framework of how we evaluate a data hinges around the fact that you ask whether something is an important gene or not as a hypothesis and then you try to shoot down that process. So the easy way for you to remember this is actually how the legal system works. So how does the legal system work whether it is in India or in the West what, what is it one tries to do. Somebody is what somebody is innocent until proven guilty and there is an additional clause there what is that clause you are innocent until proven guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt that is critical beyond a shadow of a doubt you are innocent until proven guilty. So the, the effort is on somebody to try to prove you guilty not to try to prove you innocent. So somebody has to try and prove you guilty and that to that guilt has to be shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that shadow of a doubt is something that you would have heard of okay, as a confidence level. So I trust a result within a certain confidence interval and if I see a measurement beyond that particular range of, of confidence I say that this result that I have gotten is not consistent with the original hypothesis I now go with an alternate hypothesis. One simple example here is if I toss that coin 100 times and I get 15 out of 100 heads 15 out of 100 as heads then instead of calling the coin a fair coin I say my outcome was so extreme 15 out of 100 that I would rather go with the hypothesis that it is a biased coin and not go with the hypothesis that it is a fair coin. I got an extreme result beyond a confidence interval of sorts. So therefore the entire hypothesis testing procedure involves on taking one particular statement asking whether our observations are extreme relative to a range within which that statement can be true and then therefore deciding on whether we are on the inside in which case that statement is okay or whether we are on the outside in which cases what we have seen is something extreme. Now if you think about how you identify targets you look at gene 1 what is its fold change in expression is that fold change extreme if that fold change is extreme then you say as you shortlist it and say that how extreme it was could not have been an event by chance therefore you believe that it is actually a good clinical target and for all the thousands of genes that you look at you ask if there had been some random variation in their expression levels within what range could that random variation have been and you therefore assign some confidence interval and when you see a measurement well beyond that okay in terms of either fold up regulation or fold down regulation at this point you say I saw something so extreme it could not have been by randomness could not have been by chance therefore there is something going on there as to why this particular candidate is over or under expressed okay. However what we know is that these findings these kinds of studies in terms of statistics they are limited for several reasons and, and in principle the reason that these findings are less likely to be true is if whatever you are looking for is a small effect then odds are that you know you are going out on a limb by saying something is a significant gene when all you were out to do in the first place was to create a small effect okay odds are you have found a wrong candidate. Also if your effect sizes are small if your sample sizes are small then you have really, really no business saying that something is an extreme result. And if you are looking at many relationships if in, in for example in the omics case if you are looking at many genes and trying to make the argument that this gene is important that gene is important and you have got a whole bunch of genes to analyze one after another the larger that pool of things being tested odds are you are making mistakes and I will come back to that in a minute. But take these points okay in the context of what threatens reproducibility I am not sure you can see this very clearly some interesting buzzwords interesting terms which later on I really recommend all of you go look up. So if you look at if you look at this cycle and in fact it is a cycle because it is a publication publication cycle it is it is how one does research with publications in mind. So if you look at um, the way you are supposed to operate you are supposed to operate at the top right there where you generate a, a, a very specific hypothesis. You generate that hypothesis you are supposed to now design experiments collect samples okay design a study and when you design a study by the way you are supposed to design what is called a powerful study I will come to that power a little in a little bit. But you design a study which is a protocol which is going to help you discriminate between a control and a test case that is that is what you mean by designing a study well and you then actually conduct the study and collect data so that is at the bottom okay notice that in red I am putting down things which can go wrong at each level. So when you are generating and specifying the hypothesis you might already be biased you are already looking out for a particular result okay and you might already be biased in how you are therefore 
trying to now carry out the study. If you think about how tobacco companies operated for a while in carrying out trials as to whether nicotine is addictive, and there's paper after paper saying, from a tobacco company saying nicotine is not addictive, there was a bias. Because they cannot be in a situation where they report that nicotine is addictive and harmful, because obviously they'll kill their own business. So you can see they're going to tweak the way their results are, and the study is done, okay, to end up with a, a result which is obviously good for them. So you generate and specify a hypothesis, you design a study, and then you're, you're worried about how capable you are of differentiating your control result from a test result. You conduct the study and then collect data. And usually a problem here is that you don't have good quality control in terms of your methodology. And then finally you get down to what's called a data analysis. And some of you, if not all of you, have probably heard of something called a p-value. How many of you have not heard of a p-value? Okay, we've all heard of a p-value. So let's discuss that p-value because a lot of omics critically hinges on the interpretation of a p-value and what you can do with it. Okay, there's in fact, unfortunately, a phenomenon called p-hacking. And again, you really want to look up p-hacking if you've not seen this before, which comes about where people use the p-value concept without having a true understanding of it and try to label some targets as being important and others as unimportant. So the interpretation of this data uh, via um, uh, a hypothesis testing approach leads people usually, once you get this data, then you're gonna do some follow-up experiment, which means you're in the next publication cycle. You've set up some follow-up activity. And now maybe you're testing these targets or you're um, testing different tissue samples using this, pub, uh, this particular protocol. You would normally get locked into some kind of a cycle where if you've already published two papers on a particular cell type and uh, with a particular subset of genes, you are forced into publishing more just to offset the costing of the research that you're doing. And this is where a bias can creep in because you're not in a position to say that what you've been doing all along is poor. You'll notice that there's this double, uh, 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 there's this line as an arc cutting across, okay? Um, the circle, and I've written harking there. Harking, H-A-R-K, refers to hypothesis after the results are known, which is unfortunately what happens to most of us, which is we generate the data and then we start asking, okay, what, what exactly are we trying to as an insight? Because at this point, you've put in a lot of time and effort into your study, you better come up with an insight. So therefore, you ask the hypothesis after the results are known, which fundamentally is cheating, because you, know, you can decide what you're going to call significant and what you're going to call insignificant. And this goalpost business, if, you're go, if you were ever going to have a goalpost to decide what's a good target, what's a bad target, that should have been done before you even looked at data. Okay, otherwise, you have the potential to cheat. So this P hacking business is the crux of most issues to do with reproducibility. So let me okay, quickly go through that concept. Okay. P hacking also has a nice phrase called data dredging basically involves you searching through a large number of hypotheses, typically with a single data set. So the data set, for example, could be that you have one genomic data set or one omics, proteomics data set, and you're asking the question, which subset of candidates are important as targets? How does our uh, hypothesis testing procedure work? So if you look at this, what, what, what does this mean? We're expecting the fact that in an experimental condition, this should have been the average value I should have seen if replicates were ever done. Now, there's already a practical problem, which is in an omics world, you're probably not going to have the luxury of doing many replicates because it's a very expensive protocol that you're executing, and you may not even have tissue samples to play around with. Okay. If you had the luxury of doing many replicates, you'd see a range of values for the same gene that range of values would follow some kind of a distribution like this, okay? And with your luck, you may end up with a result anywhere under this distribution. Just like when you toss that coin 100 times, it is possible for you to get 50 heads out of 100, but it's also possible for you to get 30 out of 100. And for that matter, 70 out of 100. These are all possible outcomes, given that you're not in the business of doing the experiment again and again and again. Notice that statistics ideally says, do things again and again and again and average them out because then you're more likely to find the true value. Intuitively, you know that, that if you work with, for example, if I ask you what's the average height of a person, what's the average height of a human being, either I can work with your, one, I can take one individual and use your height as a representative of the average, but you know that's not smart because I might end up with a short person or a tall person. 
instead the safer thing to do is what? Take an arithmetic mean of everybody out here and then use that as an estimate of the average. You know that, you know that's a better representation of an average, okay. So the whole notion that results can occur in, under some distribution, okay. But if this is what you ex, um, uh, expect, then we know that between these two boundaries here, between these two boundaries, we are in a situation where, for example, if this were 50 heads out of 100, this could be 30, this could be 70. Then we are in a situation where any outcome we see, the one time I do my experiment, between 30 and 70, any time I do the experiment once, and I see an outcome between 30 and 70, what do I say then? What do I infer as the hypothesis result? I say that my result is close enough to 50 that I probably saw a result associated with the fair coin. It is only if I see an extreme measurement sitting out here or sitting out here that I say, look, what I just saw is so extreme, I saw 15 out of 100 or I saw 85 out of 100, that is so extreme, it could not have been because of a fair coin. Therefore, I should be think, considering this coin to be a biased coin, okay. That's how we interpret a typical hypothesis. Now, if you look at this, these two barriers, which by the way are your confidence intervals, and for us typically, what is the magnitude of this confidence interval? What do we choose? Anybody has an idea? What, what magnitudes do we choose? You would have heard of a 95 percent confidence interval as a typical setting for confidence intervals. So, if there's 95 percent, okay, of confidence, what you're saying is 95 percent of the area under this curve, probability, which is probability, is between this threshold and that, which means a 5 percent sitting outside. Now the headache is how do you interpret this 5 percent sitting outside? So what does therefore this dark red shaded area mean to you? That dark red shaded area is a situation where you could have had a fair coin because the whole thing is associated with being a fair coin. These are the range of outcomes you would see with a fair coin. You could have had a fair coin but with sheer bad luck you see an extreme result like 15 out of 100 or 85 out of 100. And at this point, you go with the other hypothesis that it's a biased coin, but it could have been a rare outcome with a fair coin. In which case, as a technicality, you have made a mistake in your hypothesis. Why? Because you have gone with the other suggestion, or the other hypothesis, than with the original hypothesis. So you have gone with the assumption that the coin is biased, when you should have gone with the assumption that the coin is fair, and what you have seen is a rare event with a fair coin. So this 5 percent which is something we tend to take for granted is actually critical in an omics test because it represents an error. It represents an error in an interpretation. So this 5 percent is an error where we should have gone with the null hypothesis as this is called. We should have gone with that original hypothesis but instead we are preferring to go with an alternate belief, an alternate hypothesis. So 5 percent of the time we commit an error in an analysis. So we commit mistakes 5 percent of the time. So that's the take home message of that. But how many times did you carry out a study? How many, how many hypotheses did you test in an omics study? How many genes are you testing? If you're testing 10,000 genes in a study one after another and I just told you you're committing a mistake 5 percent of the time, then have you committed mistakes in your analysis of 10,000 genes? You would have. Somewhere in there you would have ended up with the wrong conclusion just by sheer bad luck because your error rate is 5 percent. The error rate doesn't matter much if you are testing something once. But if you tested something 10,000 times, well you didn't test one thing 10,000 times, you carried out 10,000 different tests, one per gene. And if you tested 10,000 things one after another, you have made a mistake by sheer bad luck at least 5 percent of the time which amounts to a large number of candidates potentially being wrong, okay. Therefore, if you were looking at your null hypothesis being this gene is not important and you are trying to shoot down the null hypothesis. So, if my hypothesis is this gene is not important because its expression fold change is 1 and I am looking at fold up or down regulation close to 1, then any range around 1 corresponds to my null hypothesis being right and what is the null hypothesis? That gene is not important 
and it is only when I see an extreme measurement would I now say this gene is important, but 5 percent of the time for a given gene I would make a mistake and I just did this analysis 10,000 times one after another, which means most of the times I am actually calling something important as a gene candidate which is up or down regulated, it is not even statistically important to you, it could have occurred by sheer chance. Sheer chance why? Because we did the experiment few times and with sheer bad luck we are seeing extreme results and we are being fooled into thinking that our insights are important when they are not, okay. So the p value which is now, so let us say our outcome was over here. If my outcome is over here you then ask the question how far away from this 95 percent threshold was I and how close am I to changing my mind, okay. And this p value if this so by the way if there is 5 percent of the area outside this threshold on the right there is slightly more than 5 percent of the area outside this threshold that is intuitive because I just moved the goal post inside. So there is more than 5 percent of an error that you uh, okay committing the question is how close are you to this threshold what are the odds of this error being extreme okay. So I hope you are convinced that there are many minor but very crucial considerations about a good experimental design. I hope you have learnt how to analyze your data and to make best sense out of it while thinking some very minute aspects of experimental design and data analysis. You also studied how conformational biases may lead to missing out some very important information from your data sets. Also there are various reasons like confirmation bias, design issues, data manipulation along with the lack of independent testing which could lead to the non reproducible experimental design. And if you want to publish in a very good scientific journals you need to ensure that all of these considerations have been met. I hope you have also learned about the importance of confidence interval in the selection of a potential reliable candidate. We have also learnt about how p value could affect the interpretation of results from your data. So, you need to be very careful about knowing some of the terminologies used in the statistics, how these tests could be performed and how one should really make a meaningful interpretation from the, this data set which is available to you which is usually a very large data set from the omics experiment. But what is the most significant lead out of that needs lot of consideration, needs lot of considerable thought process and your understanding from experimental design to the various type of tests being performed and then only finally you can come up with a reliable list of the proteins, biomarkers or candidate drug targets which could be meaningful for the future experiments. So the next lecture will also be continued by Professor Narona and he will further talk to you about various factors involved in good data analysis and experimental designs. Thank you.